Witch Trials Weekly, Video 32, August the 19th to August the 25th, 1692, Hangings and Escapes. Friday, August 19th, was the execution day for John Willard, John Proctor, George Jacob Sr., Martha Carrier, and Reverend George Burroughs. Elizabeth Proctor would be executed post-childbirth, assuming that she would survive giving birth in prison. Fortunately for her, the trials and executions would end before that time. Judges Hathorne, Gedney, and Corwin most likely attended today's executions. The executions were also attended by reverends such as Nicholas Noyes, John Hale, and Cotton Mather. This was actually Cotton Mather's first time in Salem all year. He wrote, It would break any heart of stone to have seen what I have lately seen. Even poor children from seven to twenty, more or less, confessing their familiarity with devils. But at the same time, in doleful, bitter lamentations, expostulating with their execrable parents for devoting them to the devil in their infancy. Perhaps... Martha Carrier's children begged her and urged her to confess. She, however, would not and maintained her innocence till the end. John Proctor didn't feel spiritually ready to die. He asked Reverend Nicholas Noyes to pray with him. Noyes declined, still exasperated that John Proctor refused to confess. Cotton Mather, however, agreed to pray with the condemned. He asked that their sins and the sins of their accusers be forgiven. He also hoped that theirs would be the last bloodshed. Reverend George Burroughs spoke of his innocence as he stood on the ladder. People were so moved by his prayers that they wept. He concluded by reciting the Lord's Prayer perfectly. Now, as we've told you before, it was a folk belief that a witch could not recite the Lord's Prayer without making a mistake. The girls screamed that the devil whispered in his ear, but the crowd felt conflicted. Cotton Mather calmed them down, saying that the devil has often been transformed into an angel of light. Neither the devil nor the folk test could be trusted, so he believed that George Burroughs' perfect recitation of the Lord's Prayer may not have necessarily proven his innocence. The hangings continued, and the bodies were buried near Gallows Hill. Stories circulated of a mass grave where the bodies were so poorly buried that George Jacob's chin and hand were sticking out as well as another person's foot. According to tradition, the Proctors and Jacob's families came to exhume and take the bodies of their kin and bury them somewhere on their lands. The supposed body of George Jacob Sr. was discovered and is now relocated in the family cemetery at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead in Danvers. On August 21st, Philip and Mary English escaped from prison and fled to New York, where they would not be sent back to face trial. They were a very affluent family and had put up a 4,000 pound bond to stay in the jailer's home with their then six-year-old daughter, Susanna. Susanna stayed with Captain John Alden as her parents fled with her eldest sister, Mary. The four remaining English children were placed in various homes in Boston. Sheriff Corwin and his men confiscated all they could from the English's home and warehouse, since escaping from prison was a crime subject to forfeiture of goods. Mary Green escaped from jail a second time, aided by her brother-in-law. She, however, was recaptured and rejailed the next day. In Boston, Mercy Short continued to be harassed by the devil. Cotton Mather took notes on her spectral torments and conversations. Supposedly, the devil told her that there was no hell, he then changed his story, saying that one could come and go from there as they pleased. She responded, Ye lying wretch, I have catched you in a hundred lies. Pray then, let Sarah Good come. If I could see her, I am confident she would tell me that hell is a terrible place. I know there is no coming out. On August 5th, Mary Bridges' five daughters and stepdaughters all confessed. The questions were all the same, their answers slightly different. They implicated more people, naming some suspects who were already arrested, some even who were dead. Sarah Bridges said Arthur Abbott was the only innocent person in jail. 
She also said that the girls were not witches as some people thought, but rather honest people who exposed the real witches. This video was produced with special permission from the author, Marilyn K. Roach, and publisher, Cooper Square Press. The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of a community under siege, covers the years 1692 to 1697 in detail. It also touches briefly on important and relevant events before and after this time. We are proud to carry all of Ms. Roach's books and publications in our museum store. To get a copy for your personal research and enjoyment, please visit www.salemwitchmuseum.com.